All right, it is our time of week where we have a guest joining us and on with us now. He is the executive director of the NFL Players Association. You may have heard his name in the news in the last few days. Uh, Damar Smith, how are you, sir? I am awesome, brother. It is, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to be with you. It really no, I appreciate it, man. Now, my first question for you is, how were you made aware of John Gruden's emails about you? Um. I was made aware that there was actually um, a coach that had said, you know, some things, uh, some things that um, <clears throat> were racist about me. Um, and then I got a call from the Wall Street Journal uh, about that and um, asked to make a comment. And, uh, and that was basically it. Um, you know, it, it it's never great <laughs> to to you know have a reporter call you to say that someone else said something about you um i mean the flip side of it is probably probably will not be the last time certainly was the first time um but um the the journal calling was a little bit of a stark um thing now, one thing that was interesting about it is the timing also overlapped with a vote with the Players Association involving you as executive director. And the first person I sent it to hit me back and their immediate thought was that the PA had leaked this in order to take attention away from that. But it sounds like you found out about this about the same time everybody else did. Well, um, I mean, I, I probably found out about it a little bit before because they called for a quote. Right. Um, I've got enough things going on, um, uh, then, um, then that. And I also think that, um, choosing to have someone, uh, or, or to disclose that someone called you a racist is never a great day. Right. So why anyway? I, I can only let people think what they want to think. Right. Now, my thought when you, when that came across, when I saw what the, you know, what Gruden had actually said was that it was like just really kind of old timey racism. Like I didn't know people like I was aware that racism was still here, but I didn't know that that was the style that, you know, that the racism was still coming down the pike in. And for me, and I was curious just how you felt about it. I saw it and was like, it is offensive, but it's so out the box. It's not like I'm personally offended, but I have a recognition of how offensive this is. Is that kind of a similar place to where you were? Uh, I was in a place where um, you you know you get told who's on the email chain, and it's people I know and people I've talked to. And really, Bamani, my only frame was. Um, wow, they seem to be really comfortable talking about this on email. Um, that that was really kind of my takeaway. It, it wasn't really, I mean, I hear you about sort of the, 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 the old time trope uh, uh, frame of this, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a gross caricature, you know, that, that you and I would have expected from, <laughs> you know, the, the, the fifties maybe, or the sixties. Um, but I, I guess my only takeaway really was it, it's a group of people who are on an email chain um, or at least, you know, there's a group of people on there um, feeling pretty comfortable about saying things. And, you know, for me, it, it um, you know, my first thought really was, OK, I got to if, if this story is going to run. Um, I've got to talk to my family. So right. that, that, that was really it. Right. Now, you put out a pretty extensive statement just about what this meant and what this represented for Black people in power as they, you know, navigate through these worlds. Because I think one thing that's interesting, especially about the NFL and the NBA, and I guess now Major League Baseball also, where all the players associations are headed by Black men. Like, this is a pretty significant level of power that involves a back and forth. Well, black, oh, see, the NBA is led by a black woman, but it leads to 
a dynamic where, and I imagine in these cases, commissioners and owners are dealing with black people in professional settings in ways that they had not necessarily before. Now you've been a U.S. attorney before, which is like the most powerful person in the world. It don't matter what you look like. They got to respect, you know, they got to respect the U.S. attorney. U.S. attorney has a jurisdiction that is kind of unsurpassed. You and I have even talked about that. So yeah. for you, the most the, powerful person in the world, I don't think so. Not the world, but I tell you this, if you're on the other side of that table, it feel like it, like, I assure you Problem. of that part. But for right. you, what was the change like going from that line of work into this, where you're dealing with people who just have absolutely no familiarity with dealing with a black person that they have to treat as some sort of peer or equal? Uh, that's, that's a real issue. Um, you know, coming... Well, you know, when, when I was running for this job, it was he's the outsider. He doesn't have a chance. Yada, yada, yada. Doesn't know sports. Um, coming into this business, it's starkly different than what we can just call the, the, the outside world of professional business. It and 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 you know this because you have a foot in both. Right. Um, on the one side of, of the outside world, there are, um, structures, boards, um, codes of conduct, um, adherence to either the SEC or the Federal Trade Commission or, um, the EEOC. Um, there are, um, generally, uh, rules by which, um, lawyers as a profession agreed to adhere to. Um, inside of corporations, there are codes of conduct. When you get into the sports world, um, there really isn't that same structure or paradigm of either um, codes of conduct by which we all agree that we're going to uh, abide by but also the compliance mechanisms aren't in sports the way that they are in um, both private practice and, and government work. Um, and, and, there, and there are, I mean, there's a little bit of a difference of, of the type of personnel, but that's just different. And as a result, I mean, let's just set this to the side for a second. You know, you and I, have been talking about um, GMs asking rookies at the combine questions that no prospective employer is allowed to ask. Right. Um, prospective uh, employees. We we've talked about things that have happened at teams that if it happened at a at a corporation, there would be an internal investigation. There would be mass firings. We would move on. Um, that's not, that's not only not the culture of sport, it's not the paradigm of sport. And I, I know that, that some people, you know, absolutely lose their minds that, that I talk about this as a business and the need for us to think about it and approach it like a business. But the things that you're talking about are, are, are two of the, sort of critical things that are just vastly different than, than in any other business. And as a result, I, I think a couple things happen. One, there's this culture that we can do or say things in, in this box. Um, and somehow we're divorced from complying with either norms or what's fair or what's more likely to achieve justice or equality because it's football. And, and you know, um, whether it's football, basketball, or anything else, how many times do you hear, yeah, 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 but that, you know what, Bomani, that's, hey, that's just sports, right? That's just the way we work. And it doesn't have to be that way. It, it just simply doesn't. And and I think, and I know that, that sport was an incredible part of of my life, both you know in in college and in high school. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not nearly the, the the talent of the people who play professionally, but 
I believe that this opportunity for people to engage in sport and for people to absorb, um, um, you know, vital lessons and, and morality plays and entertainment from this thing called sport is tremendous. It, it's wonderful. I just don't think that it has to be coexistent with the more horrible things that we've tried to eradicate out of our past. And it's not just racism, it, it's misogyny, it's homophobia. Um, it's just not treating people in a way that you would want your kids to be treated. Um, we, we saw that with the, with the US gymnast. How, how does an organization ignore their pleas for help? When you know, we were on the Costa show, we talked about it a little bit. You have a group of extremely young women who, are, who go to college to pursue their dream. They are assaulted by a predator and no one responds to their calls of help. And, and that, I mean, that, that's something that, you know, hopefully a lot of other people are going to unpack, but at some root level, someone kind of made the decision, well, you know, that's sports. We don't need the same compliance structure. We don't need the same level of accountability. And it's, um, it's a, it's false. It's just false. Right. <clears throat> Now, with this particular situation, um, the reports have been that John Gruden has reached out to you. Are those true? He did. And, and um, you know, I, uh, I texted John back after he called on on uh, Saturday. Um, I texted him and said, hey, I know you've got a game to coach. Um, let's get in touch later on in the week. Um, um, that was, you know, that was before Monday. Um at some point, I'm sure we'll talk. Okay. Now, one thing I had wondered about this is this investigation that had taken place. I think the football team in Washington had to pay a $10 million fine to the NFL. Dan Snyder um, gave up day-to-day -day control for a period of time. But while this investi investigation was going on, did the NFL Players Association have any involvement in that? Was there any, any inquiry made toward you guys? Was that strictly an NFL matter? Strictly an NFL matter. Strictly. So there was no, and now the NFLPA is saying that uh, you would like to have all of those emails released. Is there are there any legal grounds for that to be done, or is that <laughs> merely a request? It's it, it's a request. Um, you know, look, I'm 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 far more interested in the conversations between coaches and and GMs that would suggest that um, that there hasn't been a level of fairness or there hasn't been a culture um, in in the highest ranks of of coaching and and player management that matches what the league has said about it not being um, closed to to players of color or or um, hiring in the coaching ranks, I, I have less of a concern, honestly, about this being directed at just the Washington football team stuff. Um, what I'm interested in is is there correspondence that suggests that teams are making decisions about coaches um, based on the color of their skin? Um, are they actively hostile to players who have chosen to self-identify in various ways? Um, are they denigrating um, uh, you know, people based on um, sexual preference or, or, or religious identity. I, I'm, I'm not so much interested in just, I want to know about Washington football. I, I'm, I'm not. I think it would be good 
for our game and for our business, for both the league and the union to decide that we're going to turn a corner. And we've talked about diversity. We've talked about um, um, inclusiveness for years. How do we turn the corner and actually match our actions to our words? And when will we start to hold people accountable for living up to a standard um, that, that we believe um, is the acceptable standard for just human interaction. But to me, Bamani, the, the, the real winner here is um, there are few things um, as potentially beautiful and pure as human competition. Um, I mean, I'm not sliding anybody who likes to watch robot wars. I'm just not that guy. Right. But Man, you know, how many times do you have this um, wonderful window into um, the capacity that people have for for greatness, for competition, for teamwork, for sacrifice, for excellence, for committing yourself to a goal? I mean, all of these things that we want to teach our kids about the beauty of sport, what better way of of trumpeting or, or placing those ideals on a pedestal than to say that all of this other stuff that takes away from that, let's turn a corner and try to set up a world where we're not going to stand for those things. And to me, that's how you preserve enhance and 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 really build upon the beauty of sport whether it's football basketball women's handball swimming gymnastics whatever um all of those things are beautiful in and of themselves and they deserve not to be sullied by the lesser angels of our nature now, in the last week, have you had any conversations with the NFL about how to move toward that? Yeah, I mean, Roger and I have talked. I'll, you know, for now, kind of keep those conversations, you know, between us. Um, and 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 I think that it's something that I that I know we'll talk about going forward. Well, one interesting thing about Roger Goodell to me is he's got that job and he works with these owners, but I have always felt that like in his own desires, that these are things that he also cares about too. Has that been the impression that you've gotten from your dealing with him over the years? Um, Roger and I have had a difficult and, and interesting relationship over, over, you know, nearly 13 years. And, and we've had our battles certainly. Um, but we've also, uh, done some pretty amazing things together. I think, um, you know, I think that that, uh, for example, being the only business probably in the country to get through COVID the, the way that we did, um, those conversations had a lot of of depth to them uh, about sort of the moral and ethical things. I, I'm sorry, the more yeah, the moral ethical things and the moral and ethical decisions that we had to make about playing in a pandemic. Um, and we both wrestled with those things. We probably didn't always agree, but I, I will say that I found a person who was willing to embrace and, and walk through the difficult moral, ethical issues that that were on our plate. And and do I think that that's the same person that is going to um, deal with uh, these issues? Yes. Um, so, you know, look, I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be things that we disagree with, uh, tomorrow. Uh, but I do feel that, that having, uh, gone through such a difficult, um, mental and, and philosophical journey leading up to, to the season, you know, last year, um, I do think that he understands, appreciates, um, and is sensitive to the, 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 
the 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 concrete ethical things that I think that we need to confront. Now, what have you heard from your membership since all of this popped off on Friday? I mean, I, I talked to our guys um, and um, and and certainly a lot of guys have have reached out. Um, again, you, you probably know I never talk about my conversations with players. Um, uh, and, and I'm thrilled, really, for the, the friends who have reached out, um, you know, people that um, I probably haven't heard from in 20 years. Um, because, you know, this isn't just football. Um, for, for, for people who find themselves, for, for people who come from diverse backgrounds or find themselves um, in the minority on any basis, deal with this duality of this is who I am and this is where I'm being asked to work. And how do I deal with all of the issues that ping pong back and forth between those two poles of, of, of that duality. And it's not easy. You're, you're constantly struggling with how do I not sacrifice who I am in order to be successful given what I'm being asked to do? Um, when, when does the when do the things that I'm being asked to do conflict with who I am? And then the third thing is how you're being perceived. And so, um, you know, the the interesting thing, Bamani, I've heard probably equally from um, both my peers and people who are are um, let's just say younger than me um, who are grasping, you know, with this thing every day, seeing this play out the way that it is and looking for some um, guidance, direction, hope, um, you know, wh what do you tell them? You, you tell them that this isn't going to be the last time. Now, Drew Brees was a member of the executive committee of the Players Association. He was a named plaintiff in the decertification lawsuit of 2011. He is now on Sunday Night Football, and it was time for Sunday Night Football to discuss this matter. Drew Brees was literally nowhere to be found. Were you surprised that he did not have anything to say, given that platform and his role with the Players Association? Um, well, I, I'll just be dead honest with you. I didn't I didn't watch Sunday Night Football, so... Um, this is the first I'm hearing of it. Drew has always been um, a tremendous leader uh, for us. Uh, he was on the executive committee that hired me uh, back in 2009. Uh, you said, you know, he's a name plaintiff. Um, I, you know, but my, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any doubts about where Drew Brees is on this. I, I don't know what the setup was for, for Sunday night football. This is the first time I'm hearing about it, but uh, Drew is, has always been a stand-up guy for this union um, at a time when we don't typically have a lot of quarterbacks who step up for the union. Um, you know, he took it upon himself to um, help find an executive director after Gene Upshaw passed away. Um, I wouldn't envy any of those guys who were in that situation. Um, you know, guys like Mike Vrabel, guys like Brian Dawkins, um, so again, I, I don't know what the, um, plan was for, for Sunday night football. Um, but I don't, I don't have any doubts about where Drew is, um, on his union. And, and I don't have any doubts about where Drew is on, um, what he thinks is, is right. So where do you think that this all goes from here? Because it's interesting, all the, you know, this, as you said, is an NFL matter. This investigation was an NFL matter, but because the first story to come out involved you, we now come to talk to you about it. But where do you think this all goes? I mean, this is a lot of emails and an interesting window, perhaps, into what goes on with the NFL. Uh, well, I, I, I think the first place that it can't go is I, I don't think we can explain away racism, homophobia, and misogyny. 
I, I think that's where it has to start. And while I didn't watch Sunday night football, <laughs> uh, people informed me about what, what other people said. Um, I think the more we try to offer um, a, a, an apology or a defense of of comments like these or feelings like these or thoughts or positions like these, we will never turn the corner. So um, I, I, I think that's the first place it has to start. Um, after that, I think really, regardless of what's in the emails um, or, or what happens with the emails, we just have to make a decision about whether NFL football is better than this. And I think NFL football should be better than this. And I, I think that we shouldn't tolerate um, people treating other people as less, just philosophically. That's morally repugnant to me. Um, but the, the real conversation for our country is and, and and perhaps the opportunity for the NFL is how do you set an example um, for how we should interact with people um, regardless of whether they have a job in sports or not? Um, you know, maybe it's a conversation. Well, it's clearly going to be a better conversation, has to be a better conversation. I, I, I guess, Bamani, going back to that duality, right? It's like, well, does this mean that, you know, every black executive now has to kick off a conversation um, about it? Well, I, that's not fair, right? Um, why does it have to be the... Um, targeted person to then take the reins of trying to fix why they were targeted. That makes no sense to me. It seems to me that what we would want is a mutuality of people um, realizing that while we've talked about this thing to death and, you know, even when I signed on to your your uh, your website, there's that section on pronouns, and that's a wonderful way of of promoting um, equality. Um, but we've done a lot to um, set the standard for what we would expect for a more just, a more fair, and a more equal world. And we've put into place all sorts of things that should um, ensure that that not only continues, but the pace of it speeds up. None of that is going to work until we just decide that certain conduct and a certain way of thinking about people and categorizing people and reducing people is unacceptable. Just unacceptable. And, and then I think that's how we turn a corner. Um, but, you know, that's probably another generation. That is Damar Smith, executive director of the NFL Players Association. I was about to call you the executive producer of the NFL Players Association, like the oh. television show. Oh. <laughs> Not bad on that, you know, but hey, you get a cut, you get a cut as the producer, being the executive. Yeah, I know, man, I'll get those same, royalties. Get those <laughs> Jones royalties spinning out. Uh, and I do have to tell people this, speaking of executive producer, we were doing uh, Back on the Record with Bob Costas and D. Smith and Michelle Roberts joined us. And before D got there, somebody said, hey, because Ken Burns is there, like, Ken, you need to know, oh. D is going to say something to you. And I was like, whoa, does D. Smith have a problem with Ken Burns? D. Smith walked in there and fanboyed it out with Ken Burns. He did everything but tussle his hair. It was so genuine. I've never seen somebody so happy to meet somebody that short. <laughs> Man, I, look, I, I, that was one of those things that I did walk in the room. And it was kind of like, I am so embarrassed. I'm just <laughs> a fanboy. And the only way I know how to deal with this is just be the fanboy and apologize in advance. But, <laughs> 
Yeah, I just, man, I, I just love great storytellers. And um, I don't know if you saw his documentary on, on Ali. I'm oh, yeah. halfway through it right now, uh, watching it with my parents, which is phenomenal. Uh, but, you know, one of the, 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 his documentaries that really just got me through the, the last couple of, of years is the documentary on the Vietnam War. And, you know, for us, you know, you go from a certain election to someone calling the players' mothers a, a word, you go into George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the litany of people and, and then it's the storming of the Capitol and the insurrection and COVID. You and I know, I mean, you could sit and, and in this span of what, 18 months, feel like the world is tearing apart. And um, I sat down with my dad and, and I was just kind of talking about it. And he said, well, let me take you back from 1963 to 1973. And you lose civil rights icons, the, the assassination of a president, assassination of a candidate, uh, the shooting at Kent State, the Vietnam War, Watergate. And I felt like the world was tearing apart, right? And he and I watched the, the Ken Burns documentary and it, it it's at least for me it was cathartic because in a few episodes it encapsulated just how dramatic and and at times a free fall we were all in but our democracy though battered survived and so but it only did so because we had courageous people right that's where we are that's where we it are. Damar Smith, thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this three times a week. Gabe Bassane and Dave Presley handling everything behind the scenes. Thank you, gentlemen. Remember, follow The Right Time. Rate us. Review us. Give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy.